We do appreciate the presence of each one this morning. As you can tell, maybe I'm still having a little trouble with my with my voice. Uh, I'll try to make it through as best I can. I kind of got thought I got through Bible class fairly well, but by the time this hour is over, I might be struggling a little bit. We appreciate those who have led us in worship today. Brother Chuck leading the the singing and Brother Gary's comments at the table and uh, the prayer that was led today. I appreciate that a great deal. I just want to solicit your prayers uh, on my behalf, as you usually do just about every service. We come together and uh, my name or some reference to me is made in a prayer and I want you to continue to do that. I, I need those prayers and in your private prayers at home. I hope you'll remember me and uh, our work here at, at Oak Mountain. So I appreciate that a great deal. I thought about those who were uh, waiting on the table and distributing the elements to, uh, to, the, to the audience today, to the participants today, not just watchers, but active participants in the Lord's Supper. I thought about what a great opportunity that is, really. Uh, we might take that for granted and may not place a great deal of value on those who wait on the table. But, you know, I, I don't do that very often. I think I've done it once. The whole time that I've been here, and that was because I was a fill-in for somebody that wasn't there that day, and whoever was making sure everybody was here grabbed me and said, hey, you want to wait on the table? And I can just remember, I thought, well, what a great opportunity, what a great way to serve, to be able to help people remember the, the death of Jesus in this way, and the way that He's appointed. And so don't take that for granted, just try to appreciate uh, what a great honor that is. We began last week talking from 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7. And as you're turning over there, we're going to continue that today. And as you turn over there, let me just say that uh, tonight I'm going to talk about our trip to Uganda. And uh, just use the time tonight that is set aside for preaching to, to talk about that trip and show some pictures. So I've got, well, actually I've got a lot of pictures prepared to, to show and show you what we did and where we were and the work that that we tried to accomplish there. And so if you can, uh, come back tonight and, and, and watch that and be a part of that, and I, I would appreciate that. Well, we talked about husbands last week and talked about their role in the family. I began by talking about my concern for the family, for our families today, for the family in general, but especially for the families that are represented here at Oak Mountain. As you know, the, the family is really under assault and has been for quite a long time in lots of different ways. Just uh, the attitudes toward marriage has changed in our culture. Now more men and women are living together without being married. Uh, divorce and remarriage is widely practiced and widely accepted today. It may not have been a generation ago or two generations ago, but all that has changed. Now we, uh, we have same-sex marriage or homosexual marriage in, in our culture, and that's been approved by our government. And so all of that, I think, uh, erodes the, the, the family as God intended it and erodes the influence of the family as God intended it. But there are other things that harm our family, just personal attitudes like pride and, and, and greed and lust and envy and malice and bitterness. All of those do damage to our families as well. And so we want to be careful that we have the right attitude uh, as uh, we play whatever role God has for us in marriage, either as a husband or a wife or a father or a mother or a child. Sometimes marriages suffer because people go into it with some unrealistic expectations. Uh, we, may, we may think, well, I'm going to meet my Prince Charming and he's going to sweep me off of my feet. We're going to ride into the sunset on a white horse, We're going to live in a nice big castle on the hill and and then, young woman, she wakes up one day and she thinks, who is this guy? <laughs> and she uh, has a good strong dose of reality shortly after uh, the, the marriage is uh, entered into. And, and, but, and she has to realize, well, he's not my Prince Charming. That's not what I thought my marriage was going to be. And sometimes those kind of unrealistic attitudes uh, do some damage to our marriage, whether a wife goes into a marriage with some unrealistic attitudes or the husband goes into it with those same kind of attitudes. Sometimes we have to deal with those and work through those and develop a good strong marriage in spite of our expectations, what they might have been as we went into it. Well, we need strong marriages. We need strong families. And of course, 
the marriage is the foundation of the family. And where we have strong families and strong marriages, we'll have a strong culture. And where we have strong marriages and strong families, we'll have strong churches. A church is not going to last very long unless the families that compose the church are strong. Unless we have strong husbands and wives and strong fathers and mothers raising their children to respect God's will, teaching them to become faithful Christians. Now, a person can be single and still be a member of the church and actively participate and be very strong and influential. But our focus of attention here is on husbands and wives and families that are constituted like that. In fact, churches that don't have strong families don't last very long, do they? Oh, maybe a generation, maybe two generations. But unless we have families and fathers and mothers bringing their children up to be strong Christians... Well, the church eventually is going to decline, and eventually a local congregation will fade away. Which makes me think, and I think about this a lot, in fact, how long will the church at Oak Mountain last? We've been here for, I think, 34 years. I haven't been here that long, but the church has been here now for 35 years, going on 36 years. Will it make it to 50? 50 years? How about 75? How about 100 years? Do you expect people to be meeting in this place as the church at Oak Mountain, a hundred years after the church was established? Well, if we have good, strong families, and there may be other factors that enter into that, that equation, but if we don't have good, strong families, fathers and mothers raising their children to be Christians, well, then the church here is not going to last very long. And so I want to talk about the first part of this passage, 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. We looked at verse 7 in which Peter teaches husbands what they are to be last week. And so we want to look at 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Now this is consistent with what the New Testament teaches elsewhere. Shouldn't be surprised by that. And so we might find similar teaching in Ephesians chapter 5, for example, in Colossians chapter 3 and and other places. But we're going to focus our attention here on what Peter has to say. Now he addresses wives in kind of a classic not-but way. Not this, but this. And so that's just a a device, sort of a rhetorical device, in which the writer or the speaker emphasizes his point by contrasting it with a negative or with an opposite. And so we might tell our children, now you're not to watch TV, but you're to go to bed. And so you're emphasizing, I want you to go to bed, by contrasting that with what you don't want your child to do, at least at that time. Not this, you're not going to do this, but you are to do this. And Peter uses this sort of uh, device or construction in other places in, in his letter. For example, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18, he says, You were not redeemed with perishable things, like silver or gold, from your feudal way of life inherited from your fathers, but with the precious blood, as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ." Now, you were, you were redeemed. Now, now, it's not with gold and silver, not with those kinds of perishable things, as value as they might have been. You've been purchased with something mu- of much greater value than that, the blood of Jesus. Not this, but this. And then again, in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 18, he says, Servants, be submissive to your own masters with all respect. Now, not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those that are unreasonable. And so again, he's emphasizing the need for servants to obey their masters, no no matter what the character of their masters might be. And so not not just to the good and simple, but also to those that are unreasonable or difficult to work with. And then in chapter 2 in verse 23, he says it again. While being reviled, Christ did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And so the behavior of Christ is highlighted by way of contrast. He did not revile, although that might be what we would expect him to do, but he entrusted himself to his father. And so this is a a method that Peter seems to be fond of and uses a number of times in in his writing. And so I want you to do, now not, not this, but this. So let's just look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1, 3, verses 1 through 6. We'll read through it and then we'll make our comments. In the same way, now he's been establishing the principle of submission all the way back in chapter 1 and verse 13. 
Submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every human institution. And then verse 18, servants be submissive to your own masters, just as Christ was submissive to his father. Now in the same way, you know, according to this principle of submission, you wives be submissive to your own husbands so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. Your adornment must not merely be external, braiding the hair and wearing gold jewelry or putting on dresses, but let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. For this way, in former times, holy women also who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. Just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you become her children if you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. And so let's, maybe you saw that not in this way, but in this way sort of approach as we read through it. Let's talk a little bit about what a wife should not be or should not do. A wife, Peter says, should not be overly concerned with your adornment or your appearance. And so verse 3, your adornment must not merely be or must not be external, braiding the hair, wearing gold jewelry, and putting on dresses. And so here's what a, a good godly woman, woman's trying to be a Christian, conscientious, she won't be overemphasizing this aspect of her life. Rather, she'll develop other qualities. And so what wives should not be overly concerned with their adornment or their appearance. So they shouldn't be emphasizing to the neglect of the inner qualities, their external features. And so don't place so much emphasis on your hair, what it looks like, braiding the hair, or your clothing, or the jewelry that you wear. So let's just, let's just talk about that for a few minutes. You know, from, from the very earliest times of human history, for thousands of years, women have been concerned with their appearance. Now, it may be that men have been concerned as well, but for this passage's sake, we're focusing on women. And so, really from the very beginning, for thousands of years, women have been in, uh, concerned about their appearance, how they look to other people. They've worn makeup, they've dressed in elaborate clothing, they've worn jewelry, various parts of their bodies, their nose, their ears have been pierced. All of those things in order to make them attractive to, to others. They fix their hair in certain ways. All of that has been an attempt to, to look nice. Their, their external appearance, what they look like to other people. And for some women, it's always been the more ornate, the better. The more ornate the clothing, the better. The more jewelry, the better. The more stylish arrangement of the hair, the better. I was looking on the internet the other day, and, and there's a figurine, just a picture of the figurine on, uh, I think I googled uh, cosmetics or something like that. And so they showed a, a figure of an Egyptian woman, a carving from ancient Egypt, 2000 B.C. Well, she's got her hair fixed. She's got some kind of headdress on. She's wearing makeup. You know, she's got eyeshadow on. All of that is just an attempt, of course, to make herself look attractive. In 2 Kings chapter 9 and verse 30, we read that Jezebel painted her eyes. And you remember the book of Esther. A group of women were selected as potential candidates to marry the king and become queen. And Esther was one of those. But they went through a year's preparation. And so in the first six months, they were treated with oil of myrrh. In the second six months, with spices and cosmetics. So here, very early on, this is well over 2,000 years ago, uh, we have women making themselves attractive, making themselves look good by wearing makeup and fixing their hair and wearing uh, ornate clothing and all of those kinds of things. Now, now Peter does not suggest that it's sinful to wear, wear jewelry or that it's sinful to a woman for a woman to wear her hair in a stylish way. In fact, let's go to the Old Testament book of Ezekiel. And you find, I think, if you're not familiar with the passage, an an interesting passage in Ezekiel chapter 16. Ezekiel 
beginning in verse 10. So God is, God's describing His relationship with Israel. And, and what He's trying to say is that I, I, I took you to myself, I, I brought out the best in you, I treated you like a husband might treat his wife. And so He buys her good clothes, He, he gives her jewelry, He treats her in the very best possible way. And he shows his love and his concern and provision for her in that way. Now, that's what I've done for you. But listen to what he says, beginning in verse 10. I clothed you with embroidered cloth and put sandals of porpoise skin on your feet. I wrapped you with fine linen and covered you with silk. I adorned you with ornaments, putting bracelets on your hands and a necklace around your neck. God says to Israel, also put a ring in your nostril, earrings in your ears and a beautiful crown on your head. Thus you were adorned with gold and silver. Your dress was a fine linen, silk, and embroidered cloth. You ate fine flour, honey, and oil. So you were exceedingly beautiful and advanced to royalty. And so here God... Now, and so I I take that to mean that, you know, God has lavished all sorts of blessings on Israel. But He illustrates that point by using a husband and a wife. A husband would give his wife all of these things. To, to bring out his, her best. He wants her to, to be her best. But this passage goes on to say in verse 16 that you trusted in your beauty. But you trusted in your beauty. That's verse 15. And so it's not wrong for a woman to wear some jewelry or to fix her hair in a stylish way or wear fashionable clothing. Now that should not be the sole focus of her attention, and that should not be what really she appeals to or resorts to to attract, to become attractive to others. But it wouldn't be wrong to do those things. God said He had done those things for Israel. So it wouldn't be wrong to do those things. But a Christian woman should not trust in her beauty. And that's the mistake that Israel had made. She trusted in her beauty, and you actually used the things that God had given her to attract illicit relationships with the nations around her. And so even though there's nothing wrong with looking nice and wearing some jewelry and fixing your hair, we need to know that there is a certain look that's associated with evil. And so a woman can be fashionable in her dress and be attractive in her appearance, but she should not cross the line and begin to appear in a certain way that's associated with evil. And so in the book of Proverbs, the father warns his son of the evil woman. Do not desire her beauty in your heart, nor let her capture you with her eyelids. And so here's a woman who's putting on makeup and making herself attractive and emphasizing those features of her appearance in order to attract a man to illicit purposes. And God criticizes Judah for turning to other nations and compares her to a woman who makes herself attractive to an illicit lover. So look at this time, same book, the book of Ezekiel. Look at verse uh, chapter 23 this time where, remember we said she trusted in her beauty. She's using her beauty to attract uh, uh, relationships with nations that they, she shouldn't be involved with. And so Ezekiel 23, 40, furthermore... They have even sent for men who come from afar to whom a messenger was sent. And lo, they came for whom you bathed, painted your eyes, decorated yourselves with ornaments. You sat on a splendid couch with a table arranged before it on which you had set my incense and my oil. And so the the analogy is you're like a woman who fixes herself up so that she would be attractive in a physical way. She's emphasizing her physical features in order to involve herself in an inappropriate or illicit relationship with a a man. Now, Now, you as a nation, Israel, you're just like that woman. You look beautiful, you have wonderful things, but you use them in an inappropriate way. And so women at all times, in all places, have done things to make themselves attractive to others. And we might say, at least at times, especially attractive to men. And sometimes women resort to dressing in a provocative way, a sexually provocative way, so that the more sensuous parts of their bodies are emphasized in order to attract attention. So a woman can draw the attention of a man by by emphasizing certain physical features of hers. And she's trusting in her beauty. That's, That's the mistake that Israel made. 
She's trusting in her beauty. And so here she's, she's acting in an inappropriate way. Proverbs 7 and verse 10, the naive man, the simple man, the gullible man is warned about a woman dressed as a harlot. A prostitute knows how to dress to attract the attention of a man. So, I mean, you've seen that on TV, I'm sure. You've seen at least, uh, maybe you've seen episodes or movies or television shows that portray a, a harlot, a prostitute, and she's dressed a certain way in order to attract the attention of a man. And we might say that what the harlot does overtly, our fashion in- industry does in a more subtle way. Now, I might need to back off of that <laughs> a little bit. Well, sometimes the fashion industry is not very subtle at all. <laughs> but you know what a prostitute will do overtly, just, just, just be blatant and open about it, and she's emphasizing certain features of her physical appearance. You know, the fashion industry is run not by Christians, it's run by people of the world. And so they think like people of the world. And so they consider worldly things attractive to them. Now, this this is what's going to attract someone. And so they're governed by and motivated by principles of the world. And so it's no wonder that the fashions they design are worldly in their appearance. All right, right? I mean... The fashion industry is run by people of the world. They think like people of the world, and so they're going to design their clothes like people of the world. And so we need to heed Peter's words. A godly wife, a godly woman, is not to emphasize her physical appearance. He's not saying it's wrong to look nice. Fix your hair in a stylish way, wear fashionable clothes, wear some jewelry and some makeup. But we should not trust in our beauty. And use it, emphasize that in order to attract others. That approach is of the flesh, very clearly of the flesh, and not of the Spirit. We're to walk according to the Spirit, and not according to the flesh. Again, nothing wrong with looking attractive. Remember Ruth chapter 3? Ruth is going to go to the threshing floor. Naomi is telling her, go to the threshing floor. Boaz is there, he's threshing out the grain. And so she's told, wash yourself, put on your best clothes, and go down to the threshing floor. You need to look nice. (laughs) Take a bath, which people in those days probably didn't take a bath every day like we did. You couldn't just step into the shower, you know. And so wash yourself, you know, get, get fixed up, fix yourself up, make yourself attractive, go down to the threshing floor. I think actually a Christian woman should always want to present herself in a proper and dignified way. A Christian woman always wants to look her best. Always wants to present herself to others in in an appropriate, in a dignified way. But she should not trust in her beauty. I had an interesting experience in, when we were down in Tanzania, we were going, driving through a very crowded place, a marketplace, lots of people around, a lot lot of Muslims in that area. And I saw a Muslim woman, she kind of stood out from the crowd. Now, she was covered from her head to her feet. You could only see her face, but you had a very pretty face. And the long robe that she had, it was black, but had a little gold ornamentation on the front. And she caught my eye. She kind of stood out from the rest. And so here's, it appears to me, a woman, even though she's covered head to foot, she's still trusting in her beauty. She's found a way. Even though she dressed in that sort of traditional Muslim style, she found a way. To draw the attention of others by emphasizing certain physical things. Well, no, that's not what we want to do as Christian women. On the other hand, a Christian woman should not dress so drably and just so unusually or unfashionably or oddly that she draws attention to herself and and conveys really the wrong idea about what it is to be a Christian. Sometimes I, I see this and there's a story in the news about some religious cult out in the desert somewhere, and, and the women are, are dressed in very odd sort of way, so unfashioned. Now, they're modest, but they're so unfashioned, so odd, that I'm sure uh, the normal person would see that and think, man, if that's what it means to be a Christian, I don't want anything to do with that. Now, it's always the women who are dressed odd. It's, it's hardly ever the men. So, so that's, that's true sometimes. 
But the point is that her style of dress, her physical appearance is not to be what people notice most about her. On the other hand, it's to be her character. And so back in 1 Peter chapter 3, Peter says that she is to develop the inner man of the heart or the inner person of the heart. Verse 4, not external, but let it be the hidden person of the heart. The inner quality, not the outer features, but the the inner quality is what a Christian woman should possess. And Peter uh, suggests a scenario, a situation in which the proper behavior of a wife is absolutely critical. And so he says, if a Christian woman is married to an unbeliever, to a non-Christian man, it's critical. That she be what she ought to be. That she do what she ought to do. It's of the utmost importance if she wants to win her husband. Now there may come a time when a wife has a non-Christian husband and she talks to him and he's interested and listens and but doesn't respond. And then later she talks to him some more and he doesn't listen quite as much. And then she talks to him again and eventually just shuts her out and doesn't listen to her very much at all. So what is she to do then? Well, here's what Peter says. You make sure that your behavior is what it ought to be. And perhaps over time, if he sees that daily godly example in you, consistently day after day after day, eventually he'll want to become a Christian as well. Now, it might take a long time. It might be difficult. Consistency is the key, and that's the most difficult uh, principle of all. And especially under trying circumstances, it may be difficult to develop this godly character. But it can be done. It has been done. We we know that it has been done. But it can be done and has been done. What are the qualities a wife should develop? Well, she should be submissive to her husband. Verse 1, in the same way you wives be submissive to your own husbands. From the very beginning... God intended for the husband to be the leader in the family, and wives submit to the husband's authority. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 7, Paul says that the woman was created for the man's sake. And so the man is created first, and God saw it's not good for him to be alone. I'll make a helper for him. I'll make him a partner who can fill his needs and satisfy his needs. And so from the beginning, God intended for the husband to be the head of the family and be the leader in the family. Now, that's taught in other places as well. Ephesians 5, verse 22, Colossians 3 and verse 18, and Titus chapter 2 and verse 5. There's no need for us to try to soften the teaching. It says, wives, be submissive to your... That's what it means, be submissive. A wife should not be argumentative and combative and selfish and headstrong. She's to be respectful and support her husband and cooperate with him. Be submissive to him and follow his lead. Now... Husbands have responsibilities, but we talked about that last week. And Peter uses Sarah's example of respect and obedience as as an example. Uses the case of Sarah as an example. She was submissive to her husband when these angels or men visited Abraham and Sarah. Abraham told Sarah, go prepare them something to eat, which she did. And then she calls him Lord. You know, how can I have a child? My Lord being old also. And so she showed her respect and showed her obedience and submission. Now that comes easier for some people than others. (laughs) Some people it's very difficult to yield and, and submit. But that's our obligation. That's our responsibility as a Christian wife. They are to behave in a chaste and respectful manner. Look at verse 2. And so they may be won by their wives, by their example, as they observe your chaste and respectful manner. Or somebody say that's chaste, C-H-A-S-T-E, not (laughs) C-H-A-S-E-D. Chaste and respectful manner. A wife is to be wholly devoted to her husband. She's not in any way to give out signals or to give out the impression or put forth the idea that she even might be unfaithful. Her behavior is to be pure and chaste and blameless, not flirtatious, not unseemly. 
She's to respect her husband. Ephesians 5 verse 33 also says that she's to fear or respect her husband. Too many wives are critical of their husbands, critical of their faults, insulting, belittling, disrespect, disrespecting them either to their face or behind their back. And so sometimes wives get together with their, with their friends, you know, they're there and talk just about how bad their husbands are, you know. Well, a, a Christian woman ought to be praising her husband. Well, I don't know about y'all, I got a good husband. And so she's to be respectful of her husband. She needs to, be, she needs to marry somebody that's worthy of that respect. But she doesn't need to be disrespecting and belittling and critical of her husband's faults. Whether it's to his face or behind his back. No doubt Peter would say that wives should respect their husbands even if they're difficult to work with. Now, he says that about servants. Obey your masters, not only to the good in general, but also to those who are hard to work with. And no doubt she would say the, he would say the same thing about wives. Now, you support your husband and be submissive and be respectful, even if your husband is hard to work with. And then thirdly, they are to have a gentle and quiet spirit or disposition. Verse 4, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit which is precious in the sight of God. That's the very opposite of the view the world, uh, our world holds. A woman should be assertive and aggressive and bold. But it's very much like the character of Jesus, who is meek and lowly in heart. And what all Christians really should do, strive to live a quiet and tranquil life. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2. One commentator says, the quiet spirit is calm and tranquil, peaceful in itself, and spreads peace around. I thought that was a good, I thought that was a good comment. The quiet spirit is, or is peaceful, is tranquil in itself, and it conveys that peace and tranquility to others. Peter calls this spirit or this disposition incorruptible. The incorruptible uh, quality of a gentle and quiet spirit. Same word is used to refer to the blood of Jesus. An imperishable or incorruptible thing. The blood of an unblemished lamb. He contrasts this then with uh, ornate garments that he's referred to before. Not your clothing, not your jewels. Those things get old, they tarnish, they fade away. But let it be the imperishable quality of a of a a a gentle and quiet spirit and he says that this is highly valued in the sight of god precious in the sight of god and so these are the qualities that make a woman a worthy woman proverbs chapter 31 a quiet and gentle spirit chaste and respectful behavior and being in submissive submission to her husband We shouldn't equate these qualities with weakness. Proverbs 31 verse 20 says of that woman, or verse 25, strength and dignity are her clothing. And so let that be our clothing as well, strength and dignity. These are precious in the sight of God. The world may not value a gentle and quiet spirit. The world may not value submission to a husband. The world might not value the qualities that Peter emphasizes in this place But they are highly prized and precious to God. And so, if you're looking for a New Year's resolution, maybe this could be one. We we suggested that last week to the husbands. You were looking for a New Year's resolution? How about this? Be a good husband. Be a better husband. I'm going to work on being a better husband this year. I'm going to begin today. Well, what about a wife? Here's my New Year's resolution. I'm going to work on being a better wife. I'm I'm going to work on improving and making progress and becoming more the kind of wife that that God would have me to be. And so, make a commitment to improve. If we've got two people making a commitment like that, a mutual commitment, we're going to have a strong marriage. We'll have a strong family. We'll have a strong church. We're going to have a strong community. Because those things are the product of Strong marriages. And maybe more than that, we're going to have a marriage that pleases God. And so think about those things. And I'm sure this is not anything new. We've heard a lot of these things before, no doubt. 
But think about them and think about how might I improve as a husband and how might I improve as a wife. So as not only to please my husband or my wife, but to please God. If you're here today, not a Christian, you have the opportunity to respond to the gospel. If you believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that He died for your sins, if you're ready to repent and be baptized, making the confession of faith, or you can become a child of God today. If you're already a child of God, but not right with God, I encourage you to repent and prepare to meet God. Confess your sins, and He's faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins. If we can help you in some way today, we invite you to come as we stand and sing together.